everybody, my name is Zella Print, and welcome back to yet another reaction. Today I got another video for you guys from the Armchair Historian. And today, we are doing the Korean War. Because I don't know, like everything else I've touched upon when it comes to history, I know nothing of the subject. All I know is that the South was losing and UN sent in troops in and, and ultimately would be been a stalemate for ever since then. So that's pretty much basically what I know. Especially sort of from oversimplified uh, videos I watched. And whenever he comes out with another video, I'll watch. And with that being said, we're going to go ahead and get into today into this video. Three, two, one. I was going to say a joke about oversimplified, but <laughs> it would have been useless in this scenario. One, that three, two, one, go. The soldiers steady themselves against the sides of a Higgins boat as another breaker pummels the landing craft. In the back, one poor man can't keep his chow down, and in the front, someone runs prayer beads through his fingers. Another salvo from the battleships. Surely nothing could have survived the bombardment. The boat's the helmsman you know. calls out, time to go ashore. The landing ramp collides with a concrete seawall, fragments of a ladder falling imply into the passenger bay. The Americans scramble out of the boat, scaling the concrete as their enemy opens fire. But it is not the chatter of an MG-42 that greets these United States Marines, nope. but the slow chug of a Soviet machine gun. This is Incheon, South Korea. And like the Normandy landings barely six years before, this amphibious invasion will turn the tide of a war. Hi. For those of you that don't know, MG42 was a German machine gun that was used on Omaha Beach the day, day of uh, D-Day landing. A little bit of history from me. I love you. I'm Griffin Johnson, the armchair historian. The seeds that would grow into the Korean War were sown in 1945 when the Soviet Red Army invaded the peninsula following its declaration of war on Imperial Japan, which had held Korea since 1910. Soviet forces advanced down the peninsula until- I gotta take a deep look into his channel if he has a war video from of the Russian Empire versus Japan during the early 1914, 1915, not 1914, 15, 1904, 1905. Uh, war. I was about to. Say, I don't know. If, I don't know. I was about to say something else, but I don't think it was going to be the proper word for this uh, war. But I'll, I'll see. I'll take. I'll take another. I'll take a look at his channel, and I'll see if he has a video just like that, and not one that has to do with the Soviets declaring war on Japan after Japan had already surrendered from World War Two. Which I think I saw a thumbnail of, but I needn't read the title completely when I was looking through other videos on his channel. So I'll be looking into that more in the future. And I've talked enough, so let's get back to the video. Well, they reached the 38th parallel, then halted while the U.S. troops landed in the south and moved to meet them, splitting the peninsula in two. The Soviets established a communist provisional government in the north elevating Kim Il-sung, a hero of the insurgency against Japan, to the head of government. Consolidating power, Sung declared the formation of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Espousing democratic socialism, but practicing brutal authoritarianism. With North Korea lost to communism, the Americans decided to push back by establishing the First Republic of Korea. But this state was hardly a bastion of liberty and democracy. If you're a regular viewer, you no doubt enjoy quality historical content created with love, care, and attention to detail. That's why I'm happy to announce that this video is sponsored by History I Courses, like a brand new website that provides in-depth courses on many different areas in history. Enjoy hours of carefully curated historical Five content hours? and engage with the courses creator Yeesh. via the Q&A feature. Full members can also choose between streamed lectures or downloads complete with comprehensively cited and annotated transcripts in downloadable PDF format. With membership starting at just $5 a month, you'll get access to all of the content the site has to offer. At the moment, there are three courses on the site covering early Roman history, Norman England, and the American Revolution. And new content is added to the courses on a constant basis. Help support our community and encourage the creators of great historical content by signing up for history courses using our affiliate link in the description below. 
South Korea's first experience with democracy bore a disappointing resemblance to affairs in the DPRK. DPRK. When elections were held in July of 1948, US-backed candidate Syngman Rhee just barely made it over the threshold with an entirely unsuspicious 92.6% of the popular vote. Both Rhee's administration in the South and Song's administration in the North wanted nothing more than to reunite the two halves of the peninsula under their respective governments, making conflict between North and South inevitable. Rhee declared his intent to reconquer the North to American envoys and followed up his statements with a Soviet-style purge of ideological opponents, including the Chechu uprising by oh. Con the Boat League massacre saw the deaths of 60,000 to 200,000 South Korean co communists and suspected communist sympathizers on direct orders to Sir Rahim. I don't know if I pronounced your name correctly, sir. Eesh. Communist elements, which led to between 30,000 and 60,000 casualties. Rhee's roughshod approach caused his American backers to limit their investment in what they saw more akin to a diet democracy than a truly free state. Even if Rhee had gotten his war, American support would have been hard to come by. The readiness of America's ground forces had dropped precipitously, and by 1950, of the 10 combat divisions in the United States Army, only one, the 82nd Airborne, was considered combat ready. All U.S. forces had also been evacuated in late 1949, leaving the South defended exclusively by the Republic of Korea Army, or ROC Army. Observing this weakness, Kim Il-sung began to believe that he could rapidly invade and conquer South Korea. Eventually, Sung launched his invasion, but claimed to his dying day that it was a righteous response to a surprise attack from the South, which was conveniently defeated so decisively by the Korean People's Army that no evidence of the invaders was left. Meanwhile, in his memoirs, Nikita Khrushchev stated, I must stress that the war wasn't Stalin's idea, but Kim Il-sung's. Kim was the initiator. Stalin, of course, didn't try to dissuade him. The Korean War was a very unique kind of proxy war, where the larger US and USSR were mostly against a conflict that their clients in Korea were all too keen to initiate. And initiate, they did. Huh, I did not think of it that way. <laughs> I did not really think of it that way. In the early hours of June 25th, 1950, the Korean People's Army, or KPA, crossed the 38th parallel with an armored spearhead of 150 T-34-85s, rapidly pushing the ROC Army back towards Seoul, and capturing both Kaesong and Oizhengbu. Yet despite the dire situation, it was late evening before news reached the Secretary of Defense, who begrudgingly woke up long enough to leave orders for General Douglas MacArthur to investigate rumors of a disturbance Wait, along these the rumors. 38th I'm trying parallel to before going back to sleep. <laughs> While he slumbered, the ROC Army Chief of Staff, Che Pyongduk, was seemingly busy doing his best to lose the war as quickly as possible. Thanks to multiple communication failures, his counterattack with the 2nd and 7th Divisions east of Oizhengbu broke down in confusion. The isolated 1st Division mm. put up fierce resistance, but with limited anti-tank weaponry, they could do little against the horde of T-34s. With retreat as the only reasonable course of action, General Che instead ordered his troops to hold fast. Soon the 1st Division was alone, fighting a doomed last stand as the static South Korean positions were systematically annihilated. President Rhee then fled Seoul, Tell and just two fighting. days after the invasion began, the capital fell to the KPA. Wait, I thought the capital fell in three days. Was the information I had wrong? I'll have to take a look at the wiki after this. There's also a helicopter flying over right now. 
General MacArthur then ordered the commander of the 8th U.S. Army, Lieutenant General Walton Walker, to prepare all available forces in the Far East and immediately dispatch them to South Korea. This turned out to be a depressingly tiny force, consisting of only the 24th Infantry Division, armed with a charmingly vintage arsenal dating back from the Second World War. Even worse, only six transport planes were available, which could carry a single battalion. This battalion was designated Task Force Smith, and was quickly launched to secure the vital port of Pusan. That is terrible. That's n not even considered a, an entire battalion being deployed all at once. That's, that's not it. Oh my god, I didn't realize it was this in depth. At dawn on July 5th, Task Force Smith engaged the KPA for the first time at the Battle of Osan, but their equipment proved useless against KPA tanks, and they were quickly overwhelmed. However, they did hold just long enough for the bulk of the 24th Infantry Division to secure Pusan. Unfortunately, all other actions the 24th participated in afterward were abject failures, and the unit eventually sustained over 6,000 casualties, including its commander. US 7th Fleet. But these sacrifices bought time for the United States to mobilize its full military might. Within days, America had established total air and naval superiority. The Korean sky constantly filled with withering bombs. By war's end, the U.S. dropped more ordnance on North Korea than, than had been deployed for the entire Pacific theater of the Second World War. What? Bombing raids on both the invading army and North Korean infrastructure. Yet Kim Il-sung refused to back down. And on August 4th, the KPA launched an all-out assault on the perimeter around Busan. The KPA found the Americans well dug in, and the assault morphed into a protracted battle of attrition. But the perimeter came close to collapse on August 15th, when a push across the Naktong River by the KPA's elite troops managed to carve a salient known as the Naktong Bridge. Only the timely arrival of reinforcements averted disaster, all while American air and naval assets kept the North Koreans from consolidating their gains as they proceeded to devastate KPA supply lines. While the battle for Pusan raged on, General MacArthur was busy coordinating an amphibious landing at Incheon, 100 miles or 160 kilometers behind enemy lines. When told that Inshan was heavily defended and that adverse sea conditions made any landing a daunting prospect anyway, MacArthur responded thusly, The very arguments you have made as to the impracticabilities involved will tend to ensure, for me, the element of surprise. For the North Korean commander will reason that no one would be so brash as to make such an attempt. Being wow. so brash, MacArthur got the plan approved in late August oh. and Incheon's heavily defended beaches were easily cleared by a massive naval bombardment, allowing the Marine Task Force to land without incident and drive North Korea North drive the North to liberate Seoul. To everyone's surprise, the landing at Incheon proved a massive success. This forced the, the KPA to pull forces away from Pusan, allowing the defenders to stage a breakout on the 25th. This was the last straw for the North Koreans, and their morale finally shattered, with hundreds of soldiers surrendering en masse as the Americans drove north, and attracted the attention of Chinese border troops at the Yalu River. With Incheon secured, UN forces began their drive to liberate Seoul. The road to Seoul was a grueling campaign which saw intense combat around airfields and strongpoints. Flamethrowers and massive bombardments played a key role in dislodging stubborn KPA troops. The fighting oh, only- really random question. And I know this is really random and out of nowhere, but he, Armstrong just mentioned it. I know flame, aren't flamethrowers nowadays outlawed for use in combat? And what year were they uh, outlawed? If somebody in the comment section can tell me. That would be interesting because I don't remember seeing anything or talking about anything about um, flamethrowers after World War II, but apparently they were still used in the Korean War. 
But after that, I don't know when they stopped being used. Now that when they were made, um, I wouldn't say war crime illegal. That's not the words I'm trying to use. It's more like they were outlawed by the Geneva Convention. But I, then again, I don't know if they were completely outlawed. But then again, I don't see modern militaries using flamethrowers, so I'm pretty sure they were outlawed. So just let me know in the comment section below when that took effect. He worsened when UN troops met the KPA in the Second Battle of Seoul. Brutal house-to-house -house combat saw thousands of KPA soldiers killed, while American casualties hovered close to 300. Mm. UN forces ultimately seized the city on September 28th. The invasion of South Korea had been defeated not just by Amer Sporadic resistance continued through the 29th, and South Korea... Korean police began a crackdown on suspected KPA sympathizers and their families. American forces, Ugh. but by a coalition including Thai, Ethiopian, British, Canadian, and Dutch soldiers coming together for a truly international response. Morale was high, victory was sweet, and with your friend and mine, Douglas MacArthur, leading the charge, the thought on the ground was what could go possibly yeah. wrong. China. With South Korea secure, this I do know about. MacArthur and his superiors were left debating whether or not to go for a killing blow against Kim Il-sung's regime. Syngman Rhee was still determined to reunite the peninsula under his rule, and the men on the ground were eager to take revenge on the north for the casualties they had suffered during the brutal fighting around Pusan and the Nakdong River. Ultimately, the Joint Chiefs authorized MacArthur to invade North Korea as long as such operations had a reasonable chance of success. As the Americans rested on their laurels and planned for their invasion of North Korea, the People's Republic of China moved troops closer to North Korea, ultimately assembling a force of almost half a million men at the Yalu River. After the intense battles in the south, Pyongyang fell with astonishing ease. The dispirited KPA offered virtually no resistance, and the capital was taken on October 19th. The US Joint Chiefs of Staff ordered MacArthur to prepare the way for unification of a free and independent Korea, unaware that UN success had awakened a sleeping giant, yeah. the People's Republic of China. China had watched the Korean War with concern, concern that only grew as their ideological brethren in the North were routed by the capitalist forces. The same day Pyongyang was captured, 300,000 soldiers of the People's Army, led by veterans of the Chinese Civil War, crossed the border into Korean territory, and a whole new phase of the conflict began. The first Chinese offensive began on October 25th with an easy victory at the Battle of Unsan. But the People's Army did not press its advantage, withdrawing quickly back into the mountains. Then, just a week after the first offensive, the North Korean winter set in, with temperatures dropping to minus 8 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 22 degrees Celsius, accompanied by howling gales. In spite of these appalling conditions, MacArthur insisted that the offensive continue. That but the second play? encounter with the Chinese at the Changshan River on November 25th was a disaster, Turkish with the Rock 2nd Corps being wiped out and the US 8th Army being thrown into a disorderly rout. Then, on the 27th, the 30,000-strong U.S. 10th Corps was encircled by over 120,000 Chinese soldiers near the Chosan Reservoir. For 17 days, the Americans fought desperately to escape the trap, before finally breaking out to the port of Hongnam, where they were evacuated. The survivors were dubbed the Chosen Few, in a bitter play on words. Chosan oh. Reservoir was a horrendous battle with Chinese forces regularly offering no quarter to their American adversaries. Left with no choice, the UN coalition was forced to go on the defensive, and Pyongyang was abandoned on the 5th of December. The rapid retreat saw both UN forces and Korean civilians withdraw before the Chinese advance and the journey south was fraught with accidents and tragedies, including the death of General Walker, commander of all Ooh. U.S. Army forces in Korea. Only a personal visit to the troops by Walker's successor, General Matthew B. Ridgway, forestalled outright panic. 
Even so, there was nothing the coalition could do to stop the enemy advance. And in January, seven Chinese armies washed over Seoul, forcing the defenders to retreat, and Seoul changed hands for the third time. Relief wow. for the shell-shocked defenders only came when the Chinese supply lines were broken. So the capital was captured, retaken, and then captured again in, in about a year since the war started. Jesus Christ, that's... That's, that, that's insane. ...and by U.S. air power, forcing them to begin a slow withdrawal back to the 38th parallel. The U.N.'s fortunes had well and truly turned. Yet General MacArthur remained convinced that victory was possible, and even pressured President Truman to authorize the use of nuclear weapons on Korean soil. Yeah, no, that After didn't happen. After weeks of enduring this insubordinate behavior, Truman sacked MacArthur and promoted General Ridgway in his place. <laughs> that is another thing I did know. I know I knew he got sacked because he wanted the use to authorize, wanted Truman to use nuclear bombs on the both the Chinese and the North Koreans. But after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nobody wanted to use them again. Meanwhile, the Chinese were experiencing issues. Oh. The Chinese had severe supply issues throughout the war, which forced them to repeatedly surrender, capture territory, or call off otherwise successful attacks due to the threat of running out of supplies. Ooh. Of their own. Coalition air superiority remained absolute, and North Korea now resembled a moonscape of craters from ceaseless U.S. bomber attacks. Ridgway undertook several initiatives in his new position. Operation Wolfhound saw a massive air reconnaissance effort reveal the People's Army were holding their positions, if not withdrawing and Ridgway capitalized on this information to launch Operation Thunderbolt, a new drive toward Seoul. Thunderbolt brought the UN forces to the city, but the daring offensive, Operation Ripper, saw the capital change hands for the fourth and final time. Jesus Christ. From this point on, Ridgway and the UN forces doubled down on their philosophy of overwhelming firepower, leveraging superior American military technology to level the playing field with the overwhelming numbers of the People's Army. Ridgway became focused on destroying the Chinese rather than retaking North Korea, but the war devolved into a stalemate of attrition, with salience developing in the shifting lines and hard points like Porkchop Hill and White Horse Mountain changing hands in bloody tugs of war. Superior firepower or not, the People's Army was still in the fight, and the U.S. Joint Chiefs estimated that a renewed march on Pyongyang would result in a minimum of 200,000 U.S. casualties, an utterly unthinkable price for the war-weary American public to be asked to pay. Yeah. As the U.N. troops duped it out with the Chinese, politicians in Washington began to push for a settlement they saw little chance of ending the conflict any other way. Peace talks began in mid-1951, while Ridgway and his cohorts continued to battle the Chinese. But neither side wanted to risk admitting defeat, fearful of the reaction from both their government and their constituents. Belligerent diplomats and petty cultural misunderstandings caused negotiations to stall on multiple occasions as a yeah. result. There was also the thorny issue of POWs. Over 60,000 Korean and Chinese prisoners refused repatriation, preferring to stay in the South. This would result in much bickering between the two sides, dragging matters on for over a year until a ceasefire agreement was finally agreed on on July 27, 1953. The deal established a demilitarized zone at the 38th parallel and set up a neutral nation's repatriation commission to settle the ongoing POW issue. Syngman Rhee naturally refused to sign the agreement, and officially, North and South Korea are still at war to this very day. When all was said and done, the status quo came at the cost of three million lives, most of whom were civilians. Both sides committed a number of massacres, but the United States denied their own war crimes in Korea for many years while publicizing the brutality of their enemies. From 2005 to 2010, a South Korean commission conducted a large-scale investigation of war crimes, concluding that 82% were perpetrated by South Korean forces, with 18% perpetrated by North Korean forces. 
Many were motivated by fears of communist insurgents hiding among civilian populations. Like its Cold War cousin, the Vietnam War, the Korean War was a long, bloody, and ultimately futile conflict. The only difference was that the US succeeded in forgetting Korea. Mm. That was a bit of a heavy toll at the end. The amount of casualties from the war. I never knew the numbers and the war crimes that happened in the Korean War. Oof, I gotta look more into this now. But that being said and all, I have more and more history videos to watch from the Armchair Historian coming down later somewhere in the future. And I also gotta see if he has a Vietnam video because I another war I know little to nothing about all I know is a couple of the operations air campaigns and miscommunication among American soldiers trying to determine who the real enemy is even amongst uh, South Vietnamese civilians so I'll just have to look more into that in the future and with that being said, guys, hopefully you enjoyed today's react video, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!